Oh, hi. Didn't see you there. I'm going to guide you through question number one on the uh, GCSE mock paper, guys. So on question one, number one, you can see here it says, define acceleration. Um, the really common mistake people were making on this question was they were um, saying rate of change of speed. Um, what you must do when defining acceleration, you must say rate of change of velocity. Okay, and you must, must, must use the word velocity here. Okay, second part, so you're moving on from the simple definition. The second part is plotting this graph here, okay? So they give us three steps for the graph, and they want us to plot them out one at a time. What I would notice about this question that's quite important is um, at the bottom down here, it says using the space below for any calculations. It's really important you actually do use that space for your calculations because there will be working marks awarded for that. Right, so to answer this question, it's telling me from time zero to time 15, there is a constant acceleration, okay, that means a straight line, to a speed of 28 meters per second. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark those points on my graph. So it starts there, and then at 15 seconds, it moves up to a speed of 28. So I'm just gonna find that on my graph. It's a little bit difficult on the screen. I think, one, two, three, four, five. Think it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then from 15 to 32 is a constant speed, so that'll be shown by straight horizontal line um, until 32 seconds. So again, at 32 seconds, I'm going to have a straight horizontal line to there, so I'm going to mark that on as well. Okay. The final bit then. So from time 32, the car has a constant deceleration of two meters per second squared until it comes from rest. So I know it's going to be a straight line down to zero. But I don't know what, at what time it is going to reach zero meters per second. So I need to work that out. And to do that, I'm going to use the equation acceleration equals change in velocity, V minus U, over time. Okay, so here I've got an acceleration of two. Okay, I've got a starting velocity of um, zero. Okay, I've got an initial velocity of 28. And I've got a time, I don't know. I should say this is a deceleration, so it should actually be minus two here. If I rearrange that for t, time, I will get time equals 28 divided by two, which equals 14 seconds. Okay, so there was a working mark here for using this equation, and there was a working mark for working, uh, for working out. It took 14 seconds to slow down. Okay, so 14 seconds. So from 32, it takes 14 seconds to get to zero. So 32 plus 14 is 46. Okay, so at 46 seconds, it's gonna reach zero. And now it's just a case of filling in the graph. So I've got a straight line up to here. Okay, obviously you draw that with a ruler a straight horizontal line across, and then finally a diagonal line coming down like that. Obviously when you're doing this, you should definitely use a ruler. I can't quite use a ruler on the laptop there. Okay, so final part of this question, they added in some uh, circular motion. So from time 15 seconds to 32 seconds, the path of the car is part of a circle. Okay. In circular motion, we learnt in lessons that for a are a um, object or a particle moving in a circle, the resultant force must be pointing towards the centre of the circle. Okay, so the direction of resultant force is towards centre of circle. Okay, um, and that's really key. So, circular motion, the resultant force points towards the centre. What happens towards the to the velocity? And here is the trick that I'm going to catch you out with here, okay? If we look back at that graph earlier, we saw from 15 to 32, it's travelling at a constant speed, okay? However, that does not mean it's travelling at a constant velocity, because velocity is a vector and therefore has size and direction. And if something's moving in a circle, it is changing direction. 
So the key thing is here, the velocity was changing because its direction was changing. And they wanted you to say direction changing here. So the velocity, and velocity of the car, um, it is changing direction. Okay, and that's what's going to get you full marks on question number one. Okay guys, now for question number two on the GCSE paper. Okay, here we have. A force is used to move an object from the sur Earth's surface to a greater height. Explain why the GPE increases. The easiest way to answer this, and the way most people answered this, was using the equation for GPE. So the equation for GPE is GPE whoops, e equals mg. H. Okay, and from that equation, we can see very clearly why the GPE increases if you increase the height. If I increase the height of an object, the mass and the gravity, gravitational field won't change, but the height will increase, which means my GPE will increase as well. Okay, so I'd write down that equation, and I'd write, as height increases, GPE increases. That's not actually what the example were looking for from this question, although it was a perfectly legitimate way of answering the question. They were looking for this idea that if you are moving an object up, you are acting against its weight. Okay? And if you are moving an object against a force, there is going to be work done, because work done is force times distance. Okay? So why its GPE increases is because there is work done or energy transfers on the um, object due to its weight as you move it up. Okay. But both are perfectly legitimate ways of answering it. Okay, part B. We're now going to use this equation we've just written down. Okay. So first thing you're going to do when you're answering a calculation equation is you must, must, must write the equation down. So I'm going to write down G, P, E, equals M, G, H. And there is a mark for just doing that. And people made a silly mistake later on in this question and lost all the marks. But if you'd written down that equation there, you were guaranteed one of those marks. Okay, so I need to work out the total increase in gravitational potential energy. So I've got to work out what I've got in this question. There are 80 passengers each with mass 65, a height of 1,600 metres. Okay, so there's 80 people weighing 65. So the total mass is going to be 80 times 65. Okay, the G here for gravitational field strength, you should know, is always 10 on Earth. A nice easy number to remember. Times 10 and times the height is 1,600. Okay, I'm not sure I did that. I'm going to equals on that, okay? And that comes to, off the top of my head, um, 8.3 um, times 10 to the 7, okay? I put that in standard form just to make it easier, and I've rounded it to two significant figures. You should always be leaving your answer to two or three significant figures. Don't write out the whole number, okay? However, I will have not got two marks on this question yet because I've forgotten one very important thing, which is the unit, okay? And the unit of energy, of every single form of energy, is joules, capital J, okay? Now I've got full marks on that question. So moving on to the last part of this question, and this was the tricky part, okay? An engine of the train has power 1,500 kilowatts got to make sure you spot that on the unit. It's a kilowatt, not a normal watt. The time taken through the top of the mountain is 30 minutes. So another thing I've got to spot is in minutes, not seconds. Okay. Calculate the efficiency, raising the 80 passengers to the top of the mountain. Okay. It's a calculation question. The first thing I must do is write down the relevant equations. I'm trying to find efficiency. So efficiency, which I'm going to call E here, equals, and there are two equations for efficiency you work, okay? It's useful, whoops, energy output 
over total energy input. Make sure you've got your input and the right output the right way around. Times a hundred percent. Or there's another equation which is useful power output over total power input. Again, times 100%. You need to make sure you write energy or power when you write out this equation, otherwise it's pretty much meaningless. Okay. You could choose this answer, ask this question two ways. Okay, you could either use the top equation or the bottom equation. Okay, so the key things you have here is you know the power of the uh, engine of the train. That is your total power in. That's how much power is going into the system from your train. You know the useful power out. That's how much energy is transferred into gravitational energy lifting your people up. Okay. Um, we worked it out earlier. So we've got a power and an energy. We can't put those numbers straight into either one of these equations. Okay, we either have to convert the power into an energy, or we need to convert the energy into a power. And there's an equation we're going to need to do that. And that is power equals energy over time. If you had just written down these equations I've written down now, just from recall, from the recall and memorization you've done in your revision, you would have got two out of four marks, half the marks already. Okay, so it's so, so important we do that. Um, I'm going to do it by turning my uh, energy I worked out um, earlier in the question into a power, first of all. Okay, so I'm going to turn my useful power out, so P. Is my energy from before, which was 8.3 times 10 to the 7, divided by my time. So divided by 30 times 60, because time always needs to be in seconds in this. Okay? Um, that now is my third mark, okay? turning that into a um, power. Okay? And if I turn that into a power, um, then I just need to put that power and my total power in to find the efficiency. So the efficiency will be this number I work out here, divided by my total end power in, which is 1500 kilowatts, so times 10 to the 3. And if you times that by 100% so of the end, and if you do that, you will get 3.1%. Okay. The other way you could have done this was to turn the power back into an energy. So I'll just show you that way super quickly. If I can raise up and just get rid of all of this. Okay. So the other way we could have done that was to turn our power from before into an energy. So I'm going to show you how to do that eventually. I managed to do that. And we go. Okay, so I want to put my power into an energy, so I'm going to rearrange this. Energy equals power times time. Okay, so energy equals 1500 kilowatts, 10 to the 3, times my time, which is 30 times 60. Okay, that would give me an energy of um, 2.7 times 10 to the 9 joules, okay? So that's my total energy in from this uh, train uh, engine, okay? And then I'm going to use the efficiency equation again. So efficiency is my useful, 8.3 times 10 to the 7 divided by 2.7 times 10 to the 9. And that will again give me the exact same answer of 3.1%. But the key thing for me here was students not writing in the equations, and those are marks you were just throwing away. Okay, so think of the relevant equations, write them down, and then work out what you need to do. Okay, thank you. Okay, hi guys, time for question number three. 
So question number three was a moments question. So a bit of year 10 forces and a bit of year nine moments. We kind of covered that twice um, over this GCSE course. So part A, complete the statement by writing in the blank spaces. This was a pure recall question. You just have to recall the definition or the equation for a moment. And it is really important you know this one. So a moment of allo force is equal to the force, and this is where people are getting wrong, multiplied by the perpendicular, and you must write perpendicular distance. And then what distance? The distance between that force and the pivot. So the perpendicular distance to the pivot. Okay. If you do not write the word perpendicular in this definition, you do not get the mark. So you must write that. Okay. Um, we've then got a diagram of our rods. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. But the key bit on part I is state the name given to the point at which the weight of the rod acts. This is again a recall question. And this point is the center of mass or center of gravity, okay? So uh, again, the point at which the weight of an object acts is its center, the center of its mass, okay? Or we sometimes call that the center of gravity. Both, both words are absolutely fine in this context. Calculate the mass of the rod. Again, this is a nice, simple equation you should have learned. So um, weight equals mass times gravitational field strength. So if you've got something's weight in newtons here, 160 newtons, okay, and it says it in the question here, weight 160 newtons, okay. If I want to convert newtons into kilograms, all I need to do is mass equals weight divided by gravity. So from newtons to kilograms, you actually just divide by 10. So 160 divided by 10 is 16. Be careful here, you must remember to put a unit on that or your answer is meaningless, okay? It could be 16 bananas, 16 grams, 16 coulombs, 16 elephants. Without a unit, that 16 doesn't mean anything, okay? So you need to have 16 there. Final part. First thing I'm spotting here is this is four marks, okay? I'm going to need four points in this to get that. It's also one, two, three, four, five, six lines long. If you're not using that space, you're not going to be getting the four marks, okay? So let's have a look here. The rod is in equilibrium. Using data, explain why. That means they want me to use some numbers in my explanation. Okay, equilibrium. We've learned the conditions for equilibrium in class, and there are two conditions for equilibrium. The first is that, um, the resultant force on an object is zero, okay? The second condition for equilibrium, okay, is the sum of the clockwise moments. I'm, that's anti-clockwise. I'm just abbreviating this to make it quicker. You should be writing this out full when you're doing this. Sum of the anti-clockwise moments equals the sum of the clockwise moments, okay? Um, those are the two conditions for equilibrium. So the resultant force is zero, means it's not moving up, down, left, right. The sum of the moments equaling each other means it's not spinning. So not obviously equilibrium is not um, accelerating in any way, okay? There's no accelerating up and down, left, right, and it's not starting to spin faster or slower. Those are our two conditions. If you wrote those down, two marks. But they've asked us to use data to explain why. So I'm going to jump back to the first part of the question. The resultant force. Well, to find the resultant force, I need to look at all the forces on the object. And there are one, two, three forces on that object. Okay? But I can see the resultant force is going to be zero. So I've got the total upwards force is 80 plus 80. Okay, and the total downwards force is 160. So I can see the total upwards force is 160 newtons, the total downwards force is 160 newtons. Okay, so I've got uh, upwards 
force equals 80 plus 80, which equals 160 newtons, which is equal to the total downwards force. Sorry, it's difficult writing on the iPad. Um, the total downwards force. Okay, the next condition I wrote about earlier was the sum of the anti-clockwise moments equals the sum of the clockwise moments. So going back to here, okay, it is very obvious this object is not going to be starting to spin, okay, because I can see this 80 newton force and this 80 newton force are equal and they're also equal in distance from the centre of the rod. It's not going to spin. So with moments, when you're working out moments, you have to pick a pivot point, okay? You can pick the pivot to be wherever you like on the object. It genuinely doesn't matter, okay? But you want to pick it somewhere that's gonna make your life easy. And the easiest place to pick my pivot point is here. Because if I pick my pivot in the middle of the rod, I can ignore this 160 newton force because it won't be making it spin about that pivot. Okay, and if I pick my pivot point to be here, I can see the um, clockwise. Oh, crazy! The clockwise moment there is equal to 80 times the distance, which is half the distance of the rod, which is 1.2, and I can see the anti-clockwise moment from this 80 newton force is going to be equal to 80 times the distance, which is 1.2. Okay, so jumping back to here, the last thing I need is um, my moments, which is clockwise. I can't draw. Anti-clockwise moment equals 80 times 1.2, and that equals my clockwise moment, which is 80 times 1.2 as well. Okay, so that's the data I'm showing. It's the total anti-clockwise and the total clockwise. Okay, and this is when my pivot is at the center of the rod. Okay, so when pivot is at the center of the rod, my clockwise and anti-clockwise are equal. And I'm using data to show that in both these cases, and I've got my two conditions there, and that will get me full marks on this question. Okay, time question number four. Question number four was a year nine topic, so it's our thermal topics, so our heating topics. Question number four. We've got a copper sheet that's been painted two different colours, okay? And I've got two hands on either side, the copper sheet is really hot, and I'm trying to feel the, um, the temperature difference between both sides. So part one is explaining why my hands, or her hands in this example, are not heated by conduction. They were a little bit mean with the masking on this one. Okay? What they wanted you to say was that my hands are not touching. Okay, fine, a lot of people said that, but that wasn't enough to get them on. What they wanted you to say was, that in between the copper and her hands is air, okay? And air is unable to conduct heat, or air is not a conductor of heat, okay? I'll invert them because air cannot conduct heat to her hands, okay? Um, next part. State and explain which hand gets hotter. So state and explain. Actually, people were really good with stating and explaining it, but I clearly read the question. So state. In this case, it is the left hand. But why is it the left hand? Okay. And that's due to the colour of the left hand. So if there's no conduction taking place, okay, the way heat's getting to our hand is either convection or radiation. Um, and in this case, it's going to be radiation I'm going to be talking about. Because that's the difference between each side is their colour, and colour is what affects radiation. Okay. So the matte black side and the polished side. So you should have remembered, okay, from your revision and from year 9, or maybe if you recapped it this year, okay, matte black is the best absorber 
but also the best emitter of heat. Okay, it's the best colour at giving out heat as well as absorbing it. And in this case, it is the copper that is hot and our hands that are feeling it. So the thing that matters is what is a better emitter or radiator of heat. Okay, so if the matte black side is a better radiator of heat, that side will feel hotter because it's giving off more heat. So left hand, because matte black is a better emitter of heat radiation. Okay. Um, and that's the full master. Okay, part C was tricky, and part C lots of people genuinely struggled on. Okay, it is suggested that one side of the copper sheet cools to a lower temperature than the other. Explain why this does not happen. Okay, why would that not happen? The matte black side is giving off more heat, so why doesn't that side cool down uh, to a lower temperature? Why doesn't it cool down quicker? And the key thing is, well, although the sides are of different colours, it's still a copper sheet. And a copper is one of our best conductors of heat. So if I have one side colder than the other of my copper, very quickly heat will be transferred to the other side, and those heats will become, those temperatures will become equal again because heat is getting transferred. So it doesn't happen because copper conducts heat. So if one side is hotter and one side is colder, that will very quickly change. To get the second mark here, because it's worth out of two marks, you had to either talk about the heat being transferred, or you had to talk about copper being a really good conductor. Okay, so you could say something like, um, copper conducts heat, or copper is a really good conductor of heat, so that will happen almost instantaneously. What I think is probably the better way of answering this is say copper conducts heat, okay, so heat will be transferred to the cooler side, okay, preventing it getting any colder than the warmer side, okay, and that there will get you all five marks on this. Okay, for question five, part A, there's two marks available and you need to remember four different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So part A in this section is infrared. Uh, part B is ultraviolet. C is x-rays. And D is gamma rays. Um, if you can't remember what the different sections of the electromagnetic spectrum are, there is a very annoying song that you can find on YouTube uh, that can help you to memorise that. Okay, question, okay, question 5B, B, part 1, is asking us to calculate, calculate, calculate the angle of diffraction in the glass, in the glass at, at S, so at, so at this point here. Um, um, now, it tells us a couple of things. It tells us, things. Things. It tells it tells us the angle of incidence is 35 degrees, 35 degrees and, it and it tells us that the refractive, refractive index for a glass or red light is 1.5. Okay, so we okay, need so to remember, need to remember for this, for this uh, question that n is equal to, is to sine i over sine r. Oh, so it's the ratio, so the ratio between, between the angle of incidence and the angle of, the angle of refraction. refraction. Um, so what we're um, looking so for is angle of refraction. So we're going to have to so rearrange that, that um, to get the angle of refraction. So if we have a look at rearranging that, we'll get sine r. Is equal to sine sin i, I over, over n. n. And then if we plug, in the, if we plug values, in the values, we know that we know sine of the angle of incidence, which is 35, divided by 1.5. Plug that into a plug that calculator, we get a sine of 35 over 1.5 is equal to. to 
not 0.38. Um, now I don't um, need to write for those. I'll calculate, calculate what I then need to do. Need to do. Then need to do because this is this sine, is sine r, r is equal to 0.38. I just want r. Um, so what, um, I, need so what I need to then do is the inverse, inverse sine of, of this, this value. value. So the inverse, so sine, the inverse, the inverse sine of 0.38, which gives me Twenty-two point five, five uh, uh, degrees. Degrees. Right there. Right there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, um, so the next, so the next point, six, six b, b, so five b, b part two. It's asking us to draw on uh, the, uh, the diagram, the refracted ray at the face x, y, x, y, and the ray emerging from the face x. Z of the of the okay, so let's break, so down, let's what break down what it's asking us to do. Asking do. I'm going to clear this uh, off the screen. Uh, off the screen. Uh, uh, let's get rid of all of that. Okay, so, okay, so this, so one, this one, uh, we need to draw uh, need to the rate as it comes in from here, in from here so from x, y, x, how, y, how it goes through, through. Uh, and uh, then how it comes out of this side here, which is x, z. So we know it comes out over here. Okay, so. So for the first, so for the bit, first bit, the refracting, the refracting ray, ray, well we know if it's, well, we know red, light if it's red light going, going in, it's going to be slowing down, down uh, as it goes, as it into, goes the into the glass. And so what that, so means, what that means is it's going to turn towards, turn towards the, the north. So rather than carrying, on, carrying straight on straight like so, so uh, what it's going, uh, what it's going to do is it's actually going to refract slightly and it's going to come down towards, down towards the north. Obviously, you'd use a ruler for this. I haven't got, I haven't got a ruler right with me right now. So it's going to come so down, it's going to, it's down, going to, it's going to go straight line, it's going to turn towards, the, towards the, normal. the normal. Now, at this now, point, this point if we draw the normal on here, the normal's, the normal's going to look like something this. like this. Now, at this point, now, at this point it's, coming it's coming from a high refractive index to a lower refractive index from the glass into the air. So, if it's going from high to low refractive index, then it's going to bend. Away, away from, the from the normal. Okay, so the red, okay, so the red beam is then going to go away from, away from the normal, which means it's going to refract, refract, refract then. then. Again, it's going again, to refract, again, refract again, again, further away from, further the, normal, away from the normal, which is going to go down. Okay, so we're going okay, to so end, end, end up with a ray that looks, ray that looks something, something like, like this for our red, red, red light. Red light. For part, for part three, three uh, from, uh, from blue ray of light, um, um, it follows the it same, follows the same ray, incident so ray, so it comes in along the same line, line here. here. Um, but you, um, need to you need to remember that for blue light, blue light, light or for light which has a shorter wavelength, wavelength um, it, um, actually, it gets actually gets refracted more, more typically. Typically. Okay. So in okay, this so case. In this case What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Gonna is it's going to come in, and it's going to bend, it's gonna bend more, more towards, towards the, normal. the normal. Okay. Okay. So it's bent so it's more, bent towards, more the towards the normal. This first, first um, refraction, refraction here at this here, first, this surface, first interval. surface interval. Uh, surface, uh, surface boundary. Sorry. And then, and then again, again, as it comes, as out, it the comes out the other side, if I just draw that normal on, you can see. You can see. Oh, oh, or what should, or what happen, should happen is it is should again, it should refract, again refract further, further or more, or more than, than the so red. So you should end up with something like this. Something now, like to get this. Now, to get the two marks for this, this question, um, um, you need to you have, need to have the, the blue beam, blue beam going, under going under the red inside the prism. Inside the prism and you need, and to, you have need to have it diverging. diverging. What that means is it's getting further away from the red outside the other side. So you can see those two lines, two lines are, are heading away from each other. So they're not going to touch each other. They're not going to cross. They're going to continue to head further away from each other. So that's how you get the two marks for this point. You have to have it below the red and it has to be Come out, it's come out the other side, heading away, heading from, away the from the red as well. Now, a lot of people, now, lot of people question, in this question, um, their, um, first, their mistake first mistake was, was getting the second, second angle, angle uh, and some of you had it going like up that. like that. Okay, so you need okay, to remember, so if it's going from high, high to low refractive, low refractive index, index, it bends, it bends away, from away from the normal. So the angle of the fraction is greater than the angle of instance. Hi guys, um, I'm going to go through question six with you now. Um, for the first one, you were asked to plot a graph, and it says, do not draw a line of best fit three points yet. If you look at this graph, you can see that each square 
is worth 20 millimeters. So that means that one small square is equal to two millimeters. Just be careful with that. A weirdly high number of you forgot to notice that it's uh, got a zero, zero point here. So the first thing you need to do is put a mark through zero, zero, then one and 21, which will be halfway through, two and 40, three and 51, uh, four and 82, and five and 103, which will be about there. Um, don't draw a line of best fit yet. It says a student appears to have an error in recording their results. Which one has the error? Look at it, they're all lying in a perfectly nice, beautiful, straight line, apart from this one. Um, so you need to identify that as the three Newton one. Quite a lot of you just wrote three, um, but that's not good enough because we need to know exactly which result you're talking about. If you wrote three, I don't know if you mean the three Newton one or the third result. Uh, so you do need to actually make it really, really clear what you're talking about. And then state and explain whether this obeys Hooke's law. So the state, the answer is yes. But you only get the yes mark if your reason is correct. So the reason is yes, as the line of best fit, I'm just writing L-O-B-F to simplify it, but you in the real thing need to write line of best fit in words, is straight. That's enough to get the marks, but you might also want to add to that that uh, the fact that it's straight indicates that false is directly proportional to extension. A huge number of you wrote that false is proportional to extension. That wasn't good enough. Because in this graph, if that's my uh, extension and that's my false, this graph here still shows it being proportional because as false goes up, the extension is still going up. So that is proportional. In order to get directly proportional, we need a straight line. Um, and Hooke's law says that it must be a straight line. Okay, for question seven, A part one, it's asking us what happens to the resistance of the resistor as the potential difference across it is increased. Um, so we've got this graph that's got some data on that's telling us the current and the voltage um, of both the lamp and the resistor. Um, so we need to have a look at the general relationships, that's the data that's been shown on this graph. So for the resistor, we can see that that's a straight line. Now, we need to remember that resistance is the ratio between the voltage applied and the current that runs through the device or through the component. So in this case, um, we can see that as the potential difference is increasing, um, the current is increasing at a constant rate for the resistor, okay? Um, so what that means is the ratio between them is also going to be constant, it's a straight line. Okay, so that tells us that the resistance is constant. For part two of this question, um, it's saying what happens to the lamp. So we still need to remember that relationship that of voltage uh, over current giving us our resistance. Um, but in this graph, what we've got, if we look at the gradient, so remember the gradient is the difference in y over the difference in x. What we're doing is the current over the voltage. So actually, this is one over the resistance. So it's the reciprocal of the resistance. Um, so what that means is if this is increasing, then the resistance is decreasing. So let's have a look at what's happening to the gradient. Well, the gradient is getting less steep, okay? So what that means is as we increase the voltage, we're getting more and more current, sorry, less and less current. So for each step that we go up here, we're getting less of an increase in current um, as we're going along. So it's getting less steep, the gradient's decreasing. 
So what that means is that the resistance, which is the inverse of the gradient, must be increasing. Okay, on to 7 part B. So for 7 part B, it's asking us to calculate the resistance of the lamp when it is at 6 volts. So, if we look back at our graph, we're going to read up from 6 volts. And at 6 volts, the lamp has this current. So if I read across, it has the current of 4.4 amps. Now to calculate the resistance, we need to remember that the resistance is the ratio between the voltage and the current. So, we know it's 6 volts, so it's going to be 6 divided by, and we've read from the graph, it's going to be 4.4 amps, which is going to give us 1.36 ohms. Put that into the calculator. Yeah. So that is our total resistance of our lamp. Okay, for question 7, part C, there's actually two ways to calculate the answer to this question. Um, there's a, a short way, a quick way, and then there's a longer way. Um, we'll do the short way first. So the shorter way um, requires us to remember um, that in a parallel circuit that's connected to a 6 volt supply, um, both the components, so the lamp and the resistor, both going to get 6 volts across them. So, like we've worked out in the previous question, the current for the lamp, so IL, is going to be equal to 4.4 uh, amps. Now, if we read on the graph again, we can work out for 6 volts what the current through the resistor is going to be. So, if we read up, Lot six and cross. We see that it's exactly so. I uh, R is going to be exactly 4.0 amps, um, and so our total current is going to be the current through one of the loops, which is through the resistor, plus the current through the second loop, which is through the uh, lamp. So the resistor and the lamp, uh, which is, gives us the total, which is four plus 4.4, which is eight. 4.4 amps. So that's the short way of doing this. The longer hand way of doing this is to work out the equivalent resistance of those two components being in parallel and then work out what the current will be as 6 volt is applied to that equivalent resistor. So to do that we need to first work out the resistance of each component. Now, fortunately, we've already worked out the resistance of the lamp. So the resistance of the lamp um, is actually 1.36 ohms, if we've just worked it out. RL equals 1.36 ohms. Now, the resistance of the resistor we need to work out. So, let me just switch the colour to green. So, RR... We know that it's going to get 6 volts, so it's going to be 6 divided by, and the current through it is 4. So 6 divided by 4 is 1.5. Let me use the calculator. Okay, so we've got our two resistances. So now we need to find the equivalent resistance. So when resistors are in parallel, the equivalent resistors equation becomes. Uh, this, I'm going to just change my colour again. So 1 over RT is 1 over RL in this case, plus 1 over RR. So we need to remember that equation. So if I plug those values in, we get 1 over 1.36 uh, plus 1 over 1.5, which gives us 143 over 102. Okay, but this is equal to 1 over RT. So we need to do 1 over that. So we need to flip that over. 
So what we actually need to do, RT is equal to 102 over 143. which is equal to, so RT, I'm going to write it here, RT is equal to 0 0.71 ohms. Um, so then we can work out the current, so R equals V over I, then I is equal to V over R. So we know that it's 6 volts, we know that the equivalent resistance, so RT is going to be uh, 0.71. So 6 divided by 0.71 gives us 8.45, uh, which actually, from the mark scheme, um, it's detailed on the mark scheme, it's actually wrong, it should be, that would be 8.5, but actually uh, it's the same if we round it weirdly, like see how you have that. Okay. Okay, for question 7, part D, we are told that the lamp and the resistor are connected in series to another power supply and the current is 4 amps. Calculate the total potential difference across the lamp and the resistor. Okay, so there's two ways, again, that we can work out this from the mark scheme. Um, the first way is using the graph. So this is the, the quicker way, let's do this one first. So if we look at 4 amps, so 4 amps on the graph, um, we can see that, now if you have to look very carefully, and you have to be accurate to about half a small square, but you can see that the potential difference for the lamp at a current of 4 amps is equal to about 4.9 volts. Now, if we do the same current, so 4 amps, and we find what the potential difference of the resistor is, we find that that's, oh, a bit squiggly, but there you go, we find that that's 6 volts. So in a series circuit, the potential across each component um, adds up to the total potential um, of the circuit. So we've got 6 volts from the resistor, we've also got 6 volts, sorry, 4.9 volts, which is equal to our uh, res voltage of our lamp. So then, some of that is 10.9 volts. So that's the total voltage. The second way of doing this um, is then to have a look at uh, that out. to have a look at calculating the equivalent resistance of those two components and then uh, working out the total current from the total resistance. So, let's have a go at that. Now, taking the same readings off the graph, um, to work out the resistance of the lamp, we do the voltage divided by the current, so we get 4.9 divided by 4, which is equal to 1.225. And then if we do the resistance of the uh, resistor, we know that its voltage is 6. And so we use 6 divided by the current, which we know is 4, which gives us 1.5. Um, so then the total resistance is going to be 1.5 plus 1.225, which gives us 2.725 ohms for our total resistance. So then, well, so then, switch back to this colour, um, our potential difference, we know if R equals V over I, then V must be IR. So then we know the current is 4, the 
total resistance is 2.725 and so what we end up with is V is equal to 10.9 volts, same as before. Okay, for question 9, um, we're asked to state the factors which completely describe a vector quantity. Um, quite a number of students gave examples of vectors in this box or simply just listed um, a couple of different things that vectors have. So what you need to say for this one and what's key is that a vector has both magnitude and um, direction. Okay, so some of you wrote magnitude, uh, comma, direction, some of you wrote magnitude or direction. Um, it needs to be both. Vectors have both magnitude and direction. Okay, for 9b, uh, it's a vectors question and it tells us that an aeroplane is flying towards the east in still air at 92 meters per second. Uh, a wind starts to blow at 24 meters per second towards the north. It says, draw a vector diagram to find the resultant velocity of the aeroplane and use a scale of one centimeter equals 10 meters per second. Okay, so this is a vector diagram. So the first thing that we need to do um, is if we're adding vectors, um, we need to decide what our start point is. So I'm just going to put a little dot and I'm going to label that star. Okay, because whenever I'm adding vectors, this is the process that we go through. So now I need to then consider each vector that we need to add. Now, we've got north, south, east, west. So if it's flying east, it's flying to the right of the page as we look at it. Okay, so obviously you can use the ruler, you can measure this. I'm just gonna sort of estimate that um, if it's one centimeter for every 10 meters per second, then it's gonna be, if I divide our speed, 92 divided by 10, that will give us our centimeters. Um, and so that's going to be about 9.2 cm. So I'm going to just throw that there. I'm going to label the arrow so it's to the right, and that's 9.2 cm. Okay, so that's our first vector. Our second vector is 24 meters per second uh, wind to the north. So that is going to be going vertically up as we look at it at the page. So again, I'm just going to eyeball it, and I'm just going to say that that is going to go up by about. 2.4 cm, so to about there, I'm going to label that 2.4 cm so we can see. Okay, so these are our two vectors. Now there aren't any other vectors, so where have I ended up? If I've added those two vectors up, I end up here, so I'm going to label that as end. Um, so then I draw a line from my start to my end, and this bit's really key. You need to remember to draw the arrow from, that shows your vector going from the start to the final position. Okay, so I need that arrow. A lot of people miss that. Um, and this is our, our sort of closing the triangle method that we're doing. So we've added uh, one vector, or we drew one vector, added the other, got to our final point, we draw a line from the start to the end. That gives us the direction of our vector. Um, and then there's one more thing that we need to do. We need to measure this. Um, and if you draw this to scale, you'll find that it should be um, about 94 or 95. Well, it actually says between 94 to 96 meters per second. So actually, they give you a little bit of uh, error or room for error in there. So within you, you draw it, but try and be as accurate as you can. Um, and you should be able to get that length. So our resultant speed is going to be 90, I'm going to say 95, so I'm going to go in the middle, 95 meters per second. And then it says angle between the resultant and the easterly direction. So remember, this is a vector diagram. We need both the magnitude, which we've just, got, we've just figured out, and the direction. So it's saying from east. So again, if we think about our north, south, east, west. Now on this page, east is going horizontally to the right. Okay, And so the angle that we need between this line, use a different colour, it's between this line and, colour, uh, and this line. So it's this angle that we need. So again, if we draw that scale, we'll just use a protractor. 
and we should measure, and we've got a range again for this, between 13.5 to 15.5 degrees. Um, and so that, I'm going to say, is about 14 degrees. Now you can actually do this by calculation, um, you can use Pythagoras for this, but actually drawing a vector diagram is the simplest, it's the quickest way of doing this. Hi, you're 11. I'm going to talk you through question 10. Uh, sorry for the confusion that it starts with B, not A, um, but it was just so that the number of marks on your paper was right. So, figure 10.1 shows a circuit with a 1.2 kilo ohm resistor and a thermistor in series. There is no current in the voltmeter. And then it says calculate the voltmeter reading when the resistance of the thermistor is 3.6 kilo ohms. So, the first thing I would be doing is to label up your thermistor on the diagram so that you can see. So I'd be putting 3.6 kilo ohms here. Now what you should see is that you've got a fixed resistor and a thermistor in series with each other, uh, connected up to a 9, nine volt source, uh, and your voltmeter is over the top of your thermistor. So you should initially be looking at that and thinking, well, that is a potential divider circuit, so I'm interested in using my potential divider equation. There is a second method to finding the answer to this question, um, and I'll run through that afterwards, but we'll start with the potential divider equation, as that is the one that most students try to use, um, which I think is a good idea. So we know that for a potential divider, we have V out is equal to V in multiplied by R1 over R1 plus R2. So we are saying what share of the voltage that is supplied by the battery does the thermistor get in this case? Now because we are looking at the voltmeter being across the thermistor, we need to make sure that we have labeled the thermistor as R1 and the fixed resistor as R2. Uh, a few students got that the wrong way round, which meant they didn't get the right answer. Now V in is the supply voltage. So I know that I have V out must be equal to nine multiplied by R1 over R1 plus R2. Now they're both in kilo ohms and because it's a ratio, I can just ignore that for now. So I could write 1.2 times 10 to the three and 3.6 times 10 to the three, um, but I'm not going to bother. I can just say 3.6 over the sum of 3.6 plus 1.2. Now, some people didn't use the potential divider equation, but did add the 3.6 and the 1.2 and got 4.8 kilo ohms as the total resistance in the circuit. And if you did that, you did get one mark. Uh, so I can say that that is equal to 9 times 3.6 over 4.8 and it is as simple as that uh, and then that should have worked out to 6.75 volts. A couple of things, um, some people were plugging in the wrong numbers and getting values greater than 9. There should be a big moment where you realise well I must have gone wrong because the number cannot be greater than 9 because the thermistor cannot take voltage that is higher than the supply voltage in which case you should stop and think carefully. So that's the first method that you could have used, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, then you could have done it a different way. You could have looked at the current in the circuit um, and calculated from V equals IR. So I'm just gonna change color pen quickly and show you that method in case you did it that way. So, we know we want to know what the voltmeter reading is when the, th uh, the thermistor has a resistance of 3.6 kilo ohms. If we do it by looking at current as well, uh, for our second method, we still want to find the total resistance in the circuit, so we still want to add up the 3.6 and the 1.2. So our total for the circuit is going to be 3.6 plus 1.2, as it was before, is 4.8 kilo ohms. And I have my equation V equals IR. Now I could do that for the total circuit and I could say um, I 
is equal to V over R by rearranging that equation. And I would then plug 9 over 4.8. So 9 because that's the supply voltage over 4.8. And because it's a series circuit, the current is the same everywhere in the circuit. And when I do that... I'm going to get, oh, and at this point, my kilo ohms is important, so I'm going to put times 10 to the 3, um, so that my current value is right, because we're not looking at ratios here in terms of the potential divider like we did before. Um, and my current works out to be 1.875 milliamps, or 1.875 times 10 to the minus 3 amps. Okay, so now I know that I have my current, which is the same everywhere in a series circuit, because I have my two resistors in the series. And at this point, because I also know my individual resistance values, I can find my individual voltage values. So I know that the 9 is being split between the 1.2 kilo ohm and 3.6 kilo ohm resistor, um, because your thermistor is a resistor. Uh, and so I can just go back to my V equals IR equation. And this time I'm going to put 1.875 times 10 to the minus 3. That's important because it was milliamps. And I can multiply that by the resistance of just the thermistor because that's then going to give me the voltage across the thermistor. And I can multiply that by 3.6 times 10 to the 3 because it's in kilo ohms. And again, that will get me the same value, which is 6.5 volts. So those are the two ways that you could have worked out the answer to this question. Uh, we had quite a lot of students not remembering the equations, which was a big problem for you, because you can't really do it without them. Uh, typically getting V equals IR wrong by putting them in different ways. So they could have said I is equal to VR, which is obviously not the case. So you need to remember one and then be able to rearrange from there. Uh, the other mistakes that students were often making uh, was uh, with the potential divider equation, putting the um, 1.2 kilo ohm resistor as R1 and not R2. So that is 10B. I'm just going to show you 10C now. Uh, which is a bit more difficult to show you because it's a written one. So forgive me if my handwriting is difficult to read on here. Um, let me just move this keyboard a second. Okay. So it says uh, figure 10.2 shows a fire alarm circuit. The circuit is designed to close switch S and ring bell B if there is a fire. Explain the operation of this circuit. So with an explain question, it's always quite tricky because you have to basically say what you see and what the physics is behind it that explains why you see it. Uh, the first thing that people typically got wrong on this question was that they looked at the circuit that contained the switch and the buzzer and we're describing that that needs to close for the buzzer to open, when really the question is focusing on how the thermistor responds to a fire and gets the switch to close. So the first thing to think about, which most people did, most people got this first mark, they needed to think about the fact that if there's a fire, the temperature obviously rises. So we have T goes up in a fire. We have a thermistor. And we know we have a graph that looks something like this. So temperature on your x-axis, resistance on your y-axis, and a shape, something like this, a curve. Uh, so we know that as temperature goes up for a thermistor, resistance will go down. That's really important. Quite a few students said that if the temperature goes up, the resistance will go up. That's a fundamental misunderstanding. So we know that in the case of a fire, the resistance of the thermistor goes down. We also know that we have the thermistor and the relay coil in series with each other, and they are each taking a voltage share of the 9 volts. Uh, therefore, if the resistance of the thermistor goes down, the total current in the circuit will go up 
because the total resistance in the circuit has gone down. So let me just put that in terms of an equation for you. So I know that I is equal to V over R, the voltage divided by the resistance, the current in the series circuit, which is the same everywhere. I know that my voltage supply is fixed at nine, and I know that my R, if the thermistor um, resistance has gone down, the total resistance has gone down too, and if the R has gone down, then I has gone up. Okay, so the first marking point came from saying that if there's a fire and the temperature goes up, the thermos of resistance goes down. So I'm just going to write that quickly. So in a fire, temperature increases. So the resistance of the thermistor decreases. That would have been one marking point. The second marking point, and I'm just going to put it in bullet points so you can see more clearly where they come from, comes from saying the total resistance in the circuit decreases. So the current flowing in the circuit increases. Uh, a few people reference voltage, which you can do, but the key here is talking about current. Because we know the relay coil is working as an electromagnet, we want a magnetic field set up, what we're actually interested in is the current flowing, not the voltage. Uh, so we can say the current flowing in the circuit increases when the thermistor resistance drops. So, from there, we can say, as the current increases, the magnetic field strength of the relay also increases. Now this is key, now this was tricky. I think most people lost this mark because uh, if you didn't specifically say the phrase magnetic field in your answer, you wouldn't have got your third mark and that's where a lot of people lost their mark. So I suppose the thing is, you need to think carefully about the language you're using. We know that the current increases when the resistance of the thermistor drops, that's great. And people then basically said, well, because the current increases, the relay is strong enough to close switch S. And yes, that's technically true, but CIE are looking for very specific physics language. And the key here is that as the current through the relay increases, so does the size of the magnetic field that is being induced. So because of that, they're specifically looking for the phrase magnetic field. So if the magnetic field strength of the relay also increases, that is therefore going to mean that switch S is attracted to the relay coil and closes. Now I could write that, but that's not what they're actually interested in in terms of marking points. So I'm just going to, in a different colour pen, sorry about that, just going to show you where the three marks come from. So you say temperature increases resistance of thermistor decreases. That would have been one. Okay, sorry for my very wonky lines there. Uh, then, talking about the current flowing, either increasing or just flowing in the first place. So if we had no current to start with, it would have been fine to say, so therefore a current flows. That would have been two. And then the third marking point comes from explicitly saying the phrase magnetic field, obviously therefore increasing and attracting switch S. So that's where those three came from. Hi again, so we're on to question 11 now, uh, which is all about the plane. So, we have figure 2.1 is a head-on view of an airliner flying at constant speed in a circular horizontal path. The centre of the circle is to the left of the diagram. 
and then you see figure 2.1, and then it asks you, part A, on figure 2.1, draw the resultant force acting on the airliner and explain your answer. Uh, so actually, this is misleading. Because it's three marker and it says explain, you might think that you actually have to write a lot, but two marks come from drawing your resultant force. Mm, on the whole, this was done okay, uh, but people did lose marks because they weren't being careful. So the key here is to read the question really carefully. So you can see that it says it's flying at constant speed in a circular horizontal path. Now the keyword I think is horizontal. Now what that means is that we know that the resultant force is going to need to lie horizontally or otherwise the plane will not be staying horizontal. Okay? If the component of the force is not acting in that horizontal plane, your plane is going to move up or down. And that's not what's happening. It's turning. It's banking left. Uh, so we know immediately that I'm looking for a force arrow that is drawn horizontally. Um, I can tell that by eye. I've been quite lenient. An examiner actually might be really very, very uh, seriously checking it. But you need to make sure, number one, you're using a pencil and a ruler. A lot of you are using pens, so don't do that. Um, and then secondly, that you are showing that it's coming from the plane, okay? It's the resultant force acting on the airliner. Now, I haven't penalized you for this, uh, but lots of you are drawing your arrows all over the place. So I was seeing a lot of things like this. Oh, let me change back to a pen. That might be more helpful. Uh, yeah, so I was seeing lots of things like this or this or this. Um, I have given you credit However, it is the resultant force acting on the airliner. So really what I'm looking for is from it originating from here. Let me just erase those arrows quickly. So another key point though, actually while we're at it, before I start drawing, is to highlight another word and that's force. Now, in the spirit of it being a bit of an English lesson, you do need to be careful when you're thinking about the language on the paper. It's really important. It says, draw the resultant force. That's force singular, that's one force, not two, not three. So as soon as I see more than one, uh, more than one arrow on the page, I can't mark it because you haven't shown that you understand the concept of a resultant force. Okay, it's saying, if we take all of the individual forces that are acting on the plane or the airliner as they've called it, what is the resultant of all of those? Okay, so we're just looking for one. Now, we know from the question that it's moving in a circular horizontal path. It's moving in a circle. And it says that the center of the circle is to the left of the diagram. Oh, I don't know why that's done that in a line. Sorry, me and technology. Let's try again. So, it's quite hard to imagine, actually, because it's kind of coming out of the page. So, if I put a little cross here, and that's the centre of my circle, I want you to imagine that plane coming out towards you and then banking to the left-hand side. And then it's going back into the page when it reaches the other side of that pivot point and back round, so it's coming round like, you can't really tell that from my video, sorry. But I hope you get the idea. Okay, so that's the circle. And we always know that if we've got a centripetal force to keep something moving in a circle, so the, the resultant of all of the individual forces are working as a centripetal force, then we know that that arrow needs to act towards the centre of the circle. So what I'm looking for is a horizontal line from the plane. Sorry, you should use a pencil and a ruler. I don't have those things. And it needs to point to the left, okay? Because that's where the centre of the circle is. It tells us that in the question. So I saw lots of arrows that one weren't from the plane, two were not horizontal, three I saw people drawing lots of forces rather than just one and it is the resultant. Okay. Now for it to be at a constant speed in a circular path, we know that the resultant has to act towards the centre of the circle. So in order to get you two marks there, you would have got one mark for drawing a horizontal line. You would have then got one mark for showing that the resultant points to the left. OK, 
okay? You would still have got another mark, or one mark, sorry, had you have done this, because you're showing that you realise that it's horizontal, um, but that is being quite lenient, okay? So you need to make sure that if you haven't understood the concept of a centripetal force, you go back over that. Now remember that the word centripetal is an adjective, it's not a noun. So we can't say, oh, there is a centripetal force, that's what it is. Centripetal describes how the force is working. Okay, so what we're saying is the resultant force from your drag, from your weight, from your lift, is all acting together to act as a centripetal force to keep it moving in a circle. So one mark for it being horizontal, because otherwise your plane would move up or down, and it's not doing that, it's just turning round. Uh, one mark for pointing to the left, because it has to act towards the centre of the circle. Now, for your third mark, that's where the explaining bit comes in. Uh, you could have got that in two ways. So you could have said um, the force acts towards the centre of the circle, and that would have got you one mark. If you'd have used the word acceleration there, that would also have been fine. So I can interchange the word force, could also be acceleration. If you said that, that would be okay. So that's one way of answering that. The second way that you could have answered would have been to have said, uh, the airliner is changing direction. which it is, obviously, um, and that is caused by a force, and I have to see that that is also in the same direction. Okay, so the word direction there is key. So the airliner is changing direction, and the force that is causing that change in direction is in the same direction as the change in direction. Way more complicated than the first way of just saying, well, the force acts towards the centre of the circle. So that would be my advice to you. That would be how I would answer that. Um, so be careful. Just because it says explain doesn't mean you have to write a huge paragraph. You could just see my purple writing, force acts towards the centre of the circle. That would have been enough. Your key was actually understanding that your resultant should have been horizontal and to the left. On the whole, that was done quite well, uh, but the vector diagram that comes next uh, caused quite a lot of problems. So the weight of the airliner is 1.2 times 10 to the 6 newtons, and there is an aerodynamic lift force of 1.39 times 10 to the 6 newtons, acting at 30 degrees to the left of the vertical. By drawing a scale vector diagram, or otherwise, show that the resultant of these two forces is in the same direction as the resultant force you drew in A. There's a lot to talk about here, so you'll have to bear with me. The first thing I would say is that some people are not being careful enough at checking their answers. The last bit of that question says, show that the resultant that you've drawn is in the same direction as that that you drew in A. Now, in A, I know my resultant force is acting to the left. That's what I drew. So I know that when I finish my vector diagram, the resultant also needs to be to the left. And there were a lot of students whose resultant that they drew from their vector diagram was in a completely different direction to the resultant that they drew uh, in part A. And that should have told you that you were doing something wrong. So I'm just gonna go back to my highlighter uh, to highlight to you the key words in part B. Just check we've got the right colour. Uh, so we've got weight. That's the first thing I'm going to highlight because it is a force. Uh, there is an aerodynamic lift force is the next one. The numbers are important but I'm not going to highlight them for now. Acting at 30 degrees to the left of the vertical. Those are my key bits. Now I go back to a pen so that I can draw you your vector diagram. The first thing I would be thinking is, okay, I need to draw two forces, weight and lift. Um, so I'm going to need a scale. 
Now, I'm not going to specifically choose one now because lots of you chose different scales and it will be difficult for you to follow if I'm telling you just about one. But what I would say is that weight in our mind acts down on the page, okay, because we're visualizing. So we know that we want to draw a weight vector vertically down. Again, that needs to be with a pencil and a ruler, and this time it has to be a specific length because it has to be to scale. Um, because they're the both forces are times 10 to the 6, I'm just going to ignore it for now. It's easier to deal with just 1.2 and 1.39. And I'm going to say that my weight value I could have drawn as 12 centimetres to represent the 1.2. And therefore, you should already be thinking that my lift uh, vector is going to be 13.9 centimetres long. I'm just going to get rid of that so that you aren't getting cluttered on your diagram. The next thing that people typically didn't do so well is how they placed their lift force vector on the page with regards to the weight. Now, because it is a lift force, it's lifting the plane up. So we're going to know that it's going to go in the general direction of up, not down. And lots of people were drawing it down. So I know that it's going to be in the general up direction, but at an angle. The next thing is that we had a lot of problems with using a protractor. If when you look, you can see that I haven't given you a mark for the ratio and the angle, and it's probably because of your angle, it's probably worth just going to your teacher and showing them what you did so that they can correct you in terms of how to use the protractor. It's kind of too hard to show you on this video. But lots of your angles weren't 30 degrees. They were often 60, which means I think you had a kind of the right idea about what you were trying to do, um, but didn't quite go right. So here's the vertical. You know that you have a vertical line. My weight is falling along the vertical line and it's to the left of it. Lots of you are also drawing it to the right. Okay, so I'm looking for an angle of 30 degrees to the left, this way, of the vertical. Okay, so if this one's my weight and I've drawn it to be 12 centimeters long, I then get my protractor out and I measure 30 degrees from there. And I'm going to then have, oh, that's very wobbly, sorry. They will obviously connect up. This one, which is my lift force, which would be 13.9 centimetres. Remember I said that you could have done a different scale. That's fine. Um, but that would be the easiest way to do it. Okay. I'm going to tell you where your first marking point comes from. Your first marking point comes from your ratio of your lift to your weight uh, forces on the page needed to be approximately 1.16. So what that means is, if you take the physical length that you drew on the page of L, so I did 13.9, and I put that over 12, I should get 1.16. So if you now measure your two vectors, your, your lift vector and your weight vector, and you divide your lift vector length by your weight vector length, you should get approximately 1.16. You might think that's being picky, but they are checking that you know how to use a scale, okay? So if you were between maybe 1.05 and 1.2, I was fine and I allowed, um, but if you were out by a lot, I didn't allow it. Um, but, so you needed the ratio and the angle for one mark, okay? The next problem that people had is that they then closed their triangle, which was fine, um, so we're going to close this one. Ooh, pen's not working very well, sorry. Okay, that should be one solid straight line. Uh, and then what they did was this. They closed the triangle so that all arrows kind of pointed round and you could just trace it round. That's a closed vector triangle that's in equilibrium, which means there is no resultant force. Okay, so we don't want that. So I'm just going to get rid of this bit and this bit, and I'm going to draw it again, get rid of that highlighter. We want the resultant, okay? So our starting point was here. And we went down through the weight, up through the lift. So if this is my start point and this is my end point, my resultant is in that direction. So I'm doing one, then the other. And then I put R here for resultant. 
Now you can see that that is horizontal and it's to the left, so it matches my part A. Okay, that is, for me, the simplest way to do this. Uh, lots of you did get a mark for closing your triangle, but then lost your third mark because it wasn't horizontal and to the left. Uh, there was also an option to draw out a parallelogram rule, which would have been fine. Uh, but the problem there, I'm just going to change colour pen, was that you were connecting the wrong bits. So, if I, I'm going to have to go into the question, I'm afraid, draw this bit and this bit, ooh, where this line is parallel to this one, and this line is parallel to this one. Lots of you were then drawing your resultant from here up to here. Ooh, sorry, don't have a pencil and a reader. Um, and that would have been wrong, because that is not the resultant of those two. If this is my start point, and I move down, and then I move up, this is my end point. I go from start to finish my resultant, is this one here, not the long, the long between the two. Um, and that was something that a lot of people got wrong. Let's see if I can get rid of these lines. Uh, if you want to uh, look at the parallelogram rule more carefully, I'm sure your teachers will be happy to help, but you can see that all you do is those two blue dotted lines and then go from your start to your finish. So your marks came from your ratio of your lines being right and your angle being 30 degrees. Then closing your triangle properly or drawing the parallelogram rule properly and closing that the right way. And then thirdly, uh, that resultant being in the same direction as in part A, which a lot of people missed. Part C, I was actually really impressed with it. It was done very well. So it says the speed is constant as the airliner flies in this circular path. State and explain what is happening to the velocity. They've given you a bit of a clue in the question because they say both speed and velocity. So immediately you should be thinking scalar versus vector, um, which gives you a bit of an idea. Um, and it says state and explain what is happening to the velocity. People miss the state bit. That literally means say what is happening. So even though the speed is constant, we know that the plane is turning left, so the direction is changing. Velocity is a vector quantity, so therefore the velocity is changing if the direction is changing. So you would have got one mark for saying velocity is changing. That is the stating part, okay? And it says state and explain. So that's the stating bit. The explanation is velocity is a vector. And because the direction of the airliner changes, oh, sorry, bad writing, the velocity is also changing. And it is as simple as that. So that's question 10 and question 11. Hope that makes sense. Hi guys, you are so nearly there. We have nearly finished uh, this mock exam. I'm really proud of you guys for sticking with us. Uh, let's see if we can get through the last bit. So, state the law of attraction and repulsion between electrostatic charges. We need the idea that like charges repel, opposite charges attract. It's that simple, it's all you need. Sometimes when people are riding in a car, they get an electric shock from the door handle when they get out of the car, suggest why this happens. So we've got two phases here. If you get a shock from something like a car, um, it's going to be due to static electricity. Now, that's not necessarily immediately obvious, unless you already knew it. Um, but what you can do is start thinking about some of the context of the question. So we've already been asked about electrostatic charges. And the next question is all about positively charged rods. So you should be thinking in your head, OK, this question's about static. So, this is, so part B was asking you, how does static cause uh, an electric shock? So the first thing we need to think about is, how did the car become charged in the first place? So what we want to say is that friction between the air and the car transfers electrons. 
Now, in this case, we don't know whether electrons have gone from the car to the air or from the air to the car, because it hasn't told us which way the car has been charged. But um, we do know it definitely has been charged, so we just need to say that electrons have gone from one of the car on the air to the other one. So that's why the car's been charged. Why is it that when you touch it, you get an electric shock? Well, there's a charge on the car. So when you touch it, that charge is going to try to balance itself out to zero. So if the car is positively charged, the car is going to try and steal electrons from you so that it ends up neutral. If the car is negatively charged, electrons are going to go from the car into you. So what we need to say is when touched, electrons flow, causing a current. And it's that current that is the source of the electric shock. Part C, you've got a positive charged rod, you hold it near a metal painted uh, uncharged tennis ball. Tennis ball. It says describe what happens to the charges on the metal painted tennis ball as the positively charged rod is brought close to it. So I've got all these positive charges stuck on the rod. What's that going to do? Well, the tennis ball is table tennis ball is covered in a metal paint. So electrons, as we know, can move through a metal. So the electrons are going to be attracted to the positively charged rod. The, uh, the protons that are in the atoms, they're going to stay exactly where they are. So what we end up with is one side of the rod becomes a net negative charge. The, char the side facing the rod becomes net negative because of extra electrons over there. The other side is now missing some electrons, so that side becomes positive. So what we need to say here is electrons move towards the rod. Yeah, they're free to move, so that's what they shall do. You're then asked, uh, why do they attract each other? Well, what we need to say is that opposite charges attract, as we said earlier. And then we need to say that the negative charges are closer to the rod. So the attractive force between the electrons and the positive charged rod is greater than the repulsion from the uh, positive side of the ball and the uh, positive rod. Yeah, so this side over here is attracting this side over here is repelling, but because this side is closer, it wins uh, and pulls it towards it. Okay, really well I'm sticking through this. Um, please remember this video will stay up on YouTube so you can go back to it whenever you need to during your revision. Um, we have tried uh, to give you as much background physics as we can while keeping this manageable. Um, but remember, if you have any questions, please speak to your teachers during your lessons. Thanks very much for watching.